Welcome to Spanish uh, 312, uh, Hopscotch, and um, it's a great pleasure to have here uh, Ryan Long, my old friend and, and colleague who teaches as a professor at the University of Maryland, uh, who is an expert on Mexican literature. Uh, he wrote a book on the post-1968 Mexican novel. More recently, he also wrote a book about Roberto Bolaño, the Chilean author who lived in Mexico uh, for a long time and then uh, wrote about Mexico from uh, Spain. Uh, we're here, however, to talk about this book, Catucho, uh, by Nelly Campobello, uh, which is a, a novel or a literary text. We might want to talk about whether it's a novel at some point. A literary text about the Mexican Revolution, and it's one of the very few uh, uh, such texts which is written by a woman, which is one of the interesting things uh, about it. So uh, thanks very much for being here, uh, Ryan. And, and my first question is, is simply going to be, uh, how would you uh, suggest starting to approach this text? Well, thank you so much, John, for the invitation. It's really great to be here, and it's really great to see you again. And I hope this is helpful um, for for your you and your class. Um, and I'm really happy to teach uh, to talk about Cartucho today. Um, to approach this novel, I would begin by thinking about its um, context, both in terms of the time period that it recounts and the time period during which it was published. Um, Nelly Campobello was from northern Mexico. She was born in Durango, but moved to Chihuahua when she was a young child. Um, and she was in areas where there was active fighting during the revolution. And so as a child um, and a teenager, she witnessed a lot of the fighting and a lot of, um, of the violent acts that you will see in the text and her family supported the revolutionary leader named Pancho Villa, who grew in strength during the first half of the Mexican Revolution, which took place roughly between 1910 and 1920. Um, and around the middle of that period, he and Emiliano Zapata were strong enough coming from the north and more or less the south central areas of Mexico to occupy Mexico City for a short time. Campo Bello's text recounts um, the years between 1916 and 1920, which is a period of Pancho Villa's decline, when he begins um, losing a lot of his most important um, fellow leaders um, to desertion or um, defeat, and eventually finds himself in a position where he's um, fighting basically a guerrilla warfare type of campaign and eventually losing to the victorious forces of uh, Venustiano Carranza, the um, constitutionalist leader. So Nelly Campobello's text recounts a young girl's vision of these years of Pancho Villa's decline and how they affect the town, mostly, if I remember correctly, of Parral, which is a town in Chihuahua. So that's the events covered in the text, but it's Important to note that the text was first published um, about 10 or 12 years after those events in 1931 in a very short print run, a small edition of 1,000 copies, um, edited by the avant-garde poet Germán Liszt uh, Arsubide. And it was re-edited nine years later under, with the assistance of a much more established writer, Martin Luis Guzman. Um, and so the publication context is notable for many reasons, but two main reasons are that in 1931, Pancho Villa was still better known probably among a lot of leaders and people who were aware of what happened during the revolution as a controversial figure. Um, and for example, in the 1931 edition, there is a section where Campo Bello refers to Pancho Villa as a bandit um, and saying that's a good thing, that he was a bandit. And in the 1940 edition, Pancho Villa has become a little bit more of a consecrated figure of the revolution. And so some of those elements uh, describing him as a bandit, for example, are, are missing or gone. It's hard to say missing because Campo Bello approved the second edition. Um, and it is the edition that you're probably reading, um, and it's the edition that all other editions have been based on um, since then. So you have a novel about the defeat of Pancho Villa 
published about 10 or 12 years later, and then kind of domesticated in a way in its second edition. Um, and so one interesting thing, though, even though the novel forms part of a cultural tradition to define the revolution for Mexican intellectuals and a broader reading public, it is a very interesting novel because of its fragmentary structure, which resists the kind of narrative continuity that a dominant narrative of the revolution might prefer to hang on to. So those are those parallel contexts, events and publication would be one way to begin talking about the novel. I, I wonder if we could say a little bit more about the structure um, mm -hmm. that, that you just, just talked about. And um, so uh, we're calling it a novel, um, right, <laughs> but but it, but it's also you know it it's it, it's also a memoir in part it, you know it's very much autobiographical it's it's based on 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 her experiences or on the or on the stories that that she's been told by her mother and by friends of the family uh, and so on and and it doesn't as you say yeah it's, it's not a sort of linear uh, uh, narrative and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, the effects of that. And, and that, and I, I'm actually thinking about your first book as well, right? The, the you know, these these attempts to narrate the revolution and the problems of the, uh, attempting to impose a sort of more linear narrative, and why why my, my Campbell Mayo might have wanted to resist those temptations. Yeah, I think um, one really interesting aspect of the first edition that is also absent from the second edition, speaks precisely to this question of structure and um, her source materials. So in the beginning of the first edition, there are two introductions, one by the editor and one by her, and they're missing from the second edition. And at the end of the introduction that Campo Bello writes, she talks about um, her friend, the Cuban journalist Jose Antonio Fernandez de Castro, encouraging her to write or to publish her stories from being a child and an adolescent in Chihuahua during the, the last years of the revolution. And she talks about a notebook that she has with her that she says um, in this introduction, I'm translating from the Spanish, I put to bed my shot ones from my green notebook, uh, acostaba mis fusilados en su libreta verde. So she has this green notebook that she's been keeping with her and writing things down. And she refers to her fusilados, whom she has put to bed in her green notebook, when she refers to the moment when Fernandez Castro asks her to, to, you know, elaborate on this and publish it. And so one part of the structure, as I'm sure you've noticed, is that there are three major parts, and the second one is called fusilados. Um, and I think for most readers, myself included, I've read the book a few times and taught it a few times, it's very disorienting. Um, you start um, with a chapter that's just called him or he, el, um, and you have this incredible first sentence, which is Cartucho didn't say his name. So where she's naming him Cartucho, but she's saying that she doesn't know what his name is. So um, I'm emphasizing that because she's from the very beginning not insisting that what she's saying is the whole truth. Um, or that she knows everything. And I think then Cartucho, of course, is a very important first word for this novel, obviously the title, but there are many critics who have talked about the novel as the structure of gunfire. So cartridges um, succeeding one another in a mechanical, automatic, um, and sometimes very aimless way, not to say that the text is aimless at all, but a way in which the parts repeat things over and over and over again, and the links between them might not be clearly linear. And I think when any nation undergoes the kind of catastrophic violence that Mexico did during the revolution, there are very seductive and understandable efforts to make sense of what happened. And making sense of what happened usually means that you have a clear beginning, middle, and end, and that something better came out afterward. Um, and I think one thing that Cartucho really emphasizes is that there was a lot of senselessness, a lot of repetition of the same kinds of deaths, and a real 
a context where making sense of it, especially with some kind of happy ending, um, is um, damaging to to the actual story. And I think that fits with also with this um, the adoption of the child narrator, mm -hmm. right? Who for whom all this stuff is you know it's all very experiential, right? You know this happens and then this happens and then the other happens. Uh, and yet not able to or, or uh, not in a position to, to to try to make make sense of that and 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 Campo Bayo wants to to keep onto that perspective mm -hmm. but i, I want to pick on, uh, on on something else I, I really like that idea of the the book itself sort of like a machine gun you know mm -hmm. like as, mm -hmm. uh, and, and its structure but also from the phrase that you quoted putting to bed um mm -hmm. my fusilados my the executed mm -hmm. uh a sense of a sense of care right for the mm -hmm. for for the you know that 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 image of um yeah is what a mother does to a child in in some ways i wonder if you could could talk a little bit about the relationship that she establishes or how she establishes the the many people from Catucho onwards who 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 come in and out of these different stories these different episodes yeah it's very impressive um the way like you said the novel or the text, and yeah, we could talk more about the the term novel, but the way the text um, successfully portrays from an adult woman's perspectives, the lived experience of a girl's and adolescent girl's experiences during the war. And there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of shocking events um, that sometimes the, the the child narrator portrays with a sort of strange indifference. Um, and then there are other episodes where there is clearly communicated a lot of pain and tenderness. There's one passage, I can't remember exactly where it is. Um, I think it's in the chapter called El Kirili, where it talks about him sort of absorbing the bullets that kill him. There's this sense of intimate contact between the machines of death and the dead that then gets translated into a lot of the type of care that the women who are left in these towns, um, many women did fight in the Mexican Revolution, but many women stayed home and took care of the children and the wounded men and the men who required food and shelter um, there's an episode where there's a barracks that gets burned down, I believe, and there's a sense in which the home front or the domestic spaces that the that the text really focuses on are where the most important work of the revolution is actually taking place, and that work is the work of caring for traumatized and injured people on a daily basis, and I think part of the text's resistance to a triumphal narrative of the revolution is to point out, like I said earlier, the senselessness of, of much military violence and military um, action, but to really emphasize the sense of paying attention to the wounded, paying attention to the traumatized, and providing a space where people can recover or people can kind of gather their their thoughts and their feelings. And I talked about this text with a group of graduate students I had this semester, and one of them really focused on this notion that what the text is about is more about caring for what's happening in this sort of domestic space and the home front, and less about the battles that the revolution is, is often better known for. I think there's a battle scene near the end of the text, but there are a few scenes that actually describe military tactics or fighting and um, that kind of thing. So the the, the phrase you're looking for, you're, you're completely right. It's from the El Kirili um, chapter. And uh, in the translation, it's page uh, eight. Uh, it talks about the tissue of his porous flesh clutching the bullets uh, right. that, that, that killed him. So this, yeah, this sort of sense of uh, intimacy. And I, I really like what you're saying about the, the home front. I, I, I guess my well, one of the things that uh, strikes me, however, is that 
because of the nature of the revolution, which at this stage is sort of more of a civil war, right? It's a right. revolution right. right within the revolution. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. is that um the home front and the and the battlefield are, are so close to each other right yeah, yeah. and and it's it's difficult to establish a distinction i remember one section and now i, I unlike you i can't remember which one it is and, and she talks about a, a corpse which is outside her window so she, she's this little girl and and outside her bedroom window there's this corpse which stays there for a few days and, and she says something like and then they, then it gets taken away or, or it disappears mm -hmm. and, and she feels it's like it's it's like her dead body in some way she, she sort of feels a connection to it and yet there's this wall right there's the the window there's, there's the separation she's separated from it but so close to it, it it's you know the, the war is at home or right next to the home and then well what is the role of uh, of women and, and the family and the home when um when the violence is so close literally outside your window right um yes and there are terrifying scenes where people who are enemies if i remember correctly enter her house and um there is a lot of street fighting in her town um of parral and that scene that you just mentioned i did have it written down here is called um from a window or desde una ventana and um that is a really again sort of moving scene where she is trying to take some kind of ownership of or care for perhaps somebody who's already dead um who is who she refers to as um durmiendo ahí junto de mí um sleeping there next to me and one thing about this sort of desire to keep this corpse in this case next to her i think has to do with the text's sort of broader topic of preservation, which I think is also related to care, taking the care to preserve what's happening. And there's a sense in which um, the women in the text are preserving the memory of what's happening. John, you mentioned at the beginning that she heard a lot of the stories from um, her mother, and a lot of the stories are passed among the women who stay behind and the women who survive more likely than a lot of the men did. And there's just two parts of the book that I'd like to mention briefly in relation to what you're describing, where the violence is coming to the domestic spaces and the, the cities and the towns where, where the women and the children are, are, are staying behind, as it were, or, or being actually not staying behind, but being part of it. Um, and there's one called The Women of the North, and in the novel called Or Las Mujeres del Norte, where it describes women repeating a man's name, um, and it says that the, the voices repeat um, the name there where life stays detained in the images of the revolution. So this is a moment in the novel that I find really striking because it talks about preserving these moments and it talks about the importance of women for preserving these moments. Um, but it also says where life stayed in the images of the revolution, as if somehow that life is stuck in the past or detained in these images and then resists becoming part of the present. Um, and that goes back to this idea that the kind of fragmentary structure um, of the text resists the continuity of a dominant narrative. And then the other example is in the really rather long section called the officers of Segundo del Rayo or los oficiales de la Segunda del Rayo, in which she talks about um, songs that people sing about the things that happened. And these are songs that remain living after the people who they're about have died. And so there's another important element to the notion of care and preservation, which is a lot of these stories and memories are cared for or preserved in an oral tradition of songs, corridos, the form of music from mostly Northern Mexico that was a way of transmitting news and events to people who probably didn't know how to read. Um, and finally, one element of this kind of topic of preservation is that in the second edition of the novel, um, Campo Bello changed some of the words that were more um, belonging to an oral tradition to words that um, 
were probably more associated with a um, a tradition of publication. So, um, no, this is all great. Just to yeah, so one of the the, the sections you were talking about there is, is page eighty six, the women of the north. The translation is um, uh, voices repeat Martin's name, Martin's name, back where life has stopped and been preserved in the images of the uh, of the revolution. Right, this this idea of 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 not allowing forgetfulness, right, not allowing amnesia uh, to 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 overtake, especially you know th these are the people who who lost out, right? You know, via via what mm -hmm. was was strong and, and 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 remembered but but also you know he's a, he's a victim of the revolution too ultimately he gets uh, uh assassinated mm -hmm. I, I i wondered so, something we we talked about uh, briefly before we started talking when we were talking about what we were going to uh, say and, and perhaps we could finish here i'm not sure you, you talked about the notion of reanimation which mm -hmm. i think is connected to this so it's it's not just that's a little bit more than preserving right that's right. It's not, they're not just <laughs> They're not just, I don't know, the glorious dead or something like that, right? But they're brought back to life, perhaps in the in the particular form that she that she chooses to recount the different episodes, these different vignettes or anecdotes of, of the revolution. I wonder if you could talk more about that idea of of bringing back to life, of of reanimating these um, the fallen, perhaps. I don't know if that's how you put it. Yeah, so there's a section called um, El Muerto, or the Dead One, um, that is, um, you know, one of the sort of more typically short two pages, um, two page sections. And its last sentences are, in spite of everything, this shot one was no longer alive. Um, he wasn't the man who had passed in front of my window. Aquel fusilado no era un vivo, el hombre mucho que pasó frente a la casa. And there's a sense here in which there's a really strong sense of pain and regret that he's no longer alive, this one who passed in front of her window. And the section I mentioned earlier about the song um, talks about how this song brings to life these dead for perhaps children, she says, who might need to learn lessons about the revolution. Um, and then also the idea that the corpse who was outside of her window is sleeping. And then if I remember correctly, there's another corpse in the text that she kind of talks about almost as a plaything. Um, and then finally, the image that I talked about earlier that you also referred to in El Kirili in the translation about somehow the, the, the dying man's body being able to absorb um, the bullets, um, a sense in which cadavers and corpses um, are so painful for the narrator that keeping them alive at some points in the narrative makes it almost seems like there are ghosts and there are references to ghosts um, at, at more than one point in the novel uh, or in the text. And so there's a sense in which these are um, perhaps unsettled spirits or animas in pena or souls who are in pain who need to be not necessarily um, relieved, but acknowledged for the violent deaths that they suffered and a sense of, like you said, you know, Villa's side lost and Villa was betrayed, um, like Zapata was uh, near the end of the revolution or after the revolution in 23 or 24. So a sense of not necessarily justice, maybe, but a sense of acknowledging the unsettled nature of so much violent death then goes back to the idea of they're dead, but they're still importantly alive because of the way they might still haunt Mexico. And I feel that's got to do with the structure that we started off with. You know, what, again, one of the things, the fact that it's not linear, mm -hmm. um, somebody can die on page, I don't know, 10, mm -hmm. for instance. I think this right. happens with Okirali, for instance. And then some episodes later, some pages later, mm -hmm. he's involved in one of the, the 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 stories. And we realize, okay, this must have happened before that. And um, and it's it's told out of, out of order. But I mean, my feeling is it's, it's, that's the way that memory works. So that's that's the way in which she's she's sensing that memory is that that these moments, these moments of great intensity, right, mm -hmm. for 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 the people involved and for her as a, a child, 
can still somehow be accessed, right? And and still somehow be be brought to life. And those those people and those events, that intensity doesn't doesn't necessarily fade. And you know, she wants to 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 remind Mexico yeah. of of that right. to some extent. Right. And if what you remember first is how they died, that shades what you remember about how they lived. So maybe how they died comes first. And that's why it might come first in the text sometimes. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for this. This has been um, uh, very illuminating uh, and, and helpful uh, and really, um, uh, help, I think, helped me certainly, and, and I'm sure others, uh, to think about how to deal with this fascinating, um, but in some ways difficult, sometimes in some ways tricky text. So thank yeah. you so much. No, thank you, John. I really hope it has helped and I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, thanks again for the invitation. It was a real pleasure to talk about Carthage with you and to share um, the thoughts I have with your students. Thanks. Thank you.